or even remove the role of the father. Social science studies speak of the benefit of having a close relationship to our father and the wholeness that it later on in life. That is not to condemn any woman who has to raise her children without a husband, as God can give grace and empowerment in these situations. However, the biblical as well as the social idea is that children will be raised having and knowing a father. Just turn off your phones, please. Can we put up uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, please? This is not all about earthly fathers. This is about spiritual fathers and mothers, the talk is really. But we have to just get an understanding first. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. Okay, uh, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So he's talking about um, mentors here, or teachers, 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 10,000 teachers. Even though you have 10,000 teachers in Christ, Christ Jesus, I became your father. A guardian is there to instruct us educationally and connect us, us relationally. We should all have guardians or mentors in our lives. When we speak of kingdom ministry, the Bible speaks not of mentors, but of fathers and sons. A spiritual father does all that a mentor does, but there is also a much deeper connection, a spiritual connection. Paul and Jesus himself both recognized the need to be spiritual fathers uh, to younger disciples. So Jesus, you know, always went around with his disciples and brought them everywhere. They eat together, they drank together, they ministered together. So he always had them with him. They were with Jesus. And Paul was the same. And Timothy was his, his son in the Lord. So he, you know. Uh, can we put up Malachi 4, verse 5 to 6, please? Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Least I come and strike the earth with a curse. So in this generation, we are hoping that this is what ha this will happen. This will happen that fathers' hearts are going to be softened and they turn to their children and the children the same. Because at the moment, you know, we are looking at a rebellious nation and rebellious people. You know, they're fighting in families and all these sort of things are going on. So this is what's going to happen. Just as in those days, this was what Elijah said. Yeah. Uh, the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So we know that God is not just for one generation, he's for every generation, multi-generational God. 
And in these last days, there is going to be that renewed understanding of the need for fathers in the church. The hearts of older men are going to be turned to younger believers who, who they will adopt as sons and daughters. And the hearts of younger believers will be turned to those God gifts to them as spiritual fathers. I remember I used to be always saying to PJ, you know, that he should take young men with him when he used to be going down to Kilkenny and all that. But he never heeded it. But I felt he was a spiritual father, you know, and he, he would have trained up other young fellas like Pat Morrissey's son and all that. I used to be always encouraging him to do it. You know, because I saw him as a spiritual father, you know, and he would have been good. He would have been good at that. And um, so, you know, um, but it's, uh, I suppose it's something the Holy Spirit has to reveal to you first. But I think, you know, uh, in a pastoral setting like this, you know, you, you are the spiritual mother, you are the spiritual father, Reverend Albert, you know. But there are many more of us coming up, you know, as, as we were spiritual children, we are becoming spiritual mothers and fathers now, those of us who are in the Lord for quite a while, you know because if there comes a time where you let go of your spiritual children, you know, and you allow them into their own ministry, allow them to be free, even though they may be part of your ministry worldwide, but you allow them on their own, like you allowed um, um, your brother, and it's just to give you an understanding, your brother and your sister-in-law down to Limerick to start, you know, you know, they were here with us, and, you know, others that you let go to their own ministry too, you know, that's, that's the understanding, you know, but as well as an earthly father, we need a spirit. Because some of our earthly fathers are not spiritual. So they're no good to nurture and instruct us and teach us. You know, and, and we, we, we look on them and we learn what they do, so we learn from them. You know, the Holy Spirit is involved in all this. You know, and he will direct you to who is your spiritual mother or your spiritual father. You know, and um, some people will have different spiritual mothers. Some people will have different spiritual fathers. But... Always look to the pastors in your church, but then sometimes spiritual children demand too much time of their spiritual fathers and mothers. And what I would say is, spend more time serving them, and you will learn more. Instead of taking their time to be mentoring you, they will mentor you, but spend more time looking at what they do and learning from them. That's the way. That, I would say that's the way. Um, um, that I would see it anyway, and I'm, I'm sure that that's the way the Holy Spirit would want it to. Um, there's an important role for spiritual mothers in the church. Uh, Deborah, she was a spiritual lead. She was known as the mother of Israel in Judges 5, verse 7. We won't go to that because we have so many scriptures. We won't have time to go to them all. And Paul saw himself as ha having the characteristics of both mother and the father. Could we put up 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7 and verse 11? One Thessalonians two seven and eleven. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So we should be comfortable with our spiritual mothers and fathers, because they're gentle with us, because they know we're still babes in Christ. Not all of us are babes in Christ here, but some of us are. You know, So they're gentle with us. They have patience with us. If we make mistakes, they understand. You know, And the same with God. He understands when you make mistakes. You know, Because you're just learning. You're just growing. You're just learning. And, um, oh yeah, you're yeah, putting it up. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, you as a father does his own children. Praise the Lord. So that's the fatherly love there, there to everybody. The same as his own, his own natural children. Okay. Um, an example of father-son relationship is between Elijah and Elisha, the prophet. Both were prophets. 
And you can find that in 1 Kings 19, verse 15 to 60. But we won't put it up because you all know the story of the young prophet teaching the, 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 the old prophet teaching the young prophet and how the old prophet went up in a chariot and uh, was taken away. You know, he didn't die physically in the natural, he was taken away in a fiery chariot. Do you remember we did that at Sunday school? Do you remember that? Yeah, okay. That's fine. The Lord said to Elisha, anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meolah to succeed you as prophet. It was not Elijah's idea to have Elisha as a spiritual son. It was something that God told him to do. Likewise, likewise, it was not Elisha's idea to have Elijah as a spiritual father. So you ask God to show you who, who he wants to be your spiritual father or mother. Um, this connection was ordained by God. It was a spiritual connection. Elijah went up to him, uh, that's to Elijah, Elisha, and threw his cloak around him. The prophet's cloak represented his office, his anointing, his mantle. I, I think we better go to 1 Kings 19, verse 19, just that they'll understand what we're talking about here. Please. 1 Kings 19, verse 19. Remember when he chose and he was, he was plowing with the yoke of oxen when the prophet came and he left everything. He said, I just kissed my mother and father goodbye and he, he left everything. He went off with the prophet. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Uh, then Elijah, Elijah, passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Do, just do the next verse. I don't think it's uh, significant, but that's it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So that's the way you put it on. So the, the mantle uh, was uh, represented his office, his anointing. The first interaction between the pair was his touching with the mantle, he touched him with the mantle. So that was a supernatural c connection. This was the, the mantle that Elijah had. He, he, he threw it on him, so he touched him with it. So there was a connection there. Um, so we don't try and make these things happen. You know, we leave it to the Holy Spirit to allow it to happen. The connection between a spiritual father and a son is something you can't plan or organize. It is something the Holy Spirit produces. Elijah gave Elisha the option as to whether to follow him or not. So it wasn't a forced connection. He gave him the option. But he decided, yes, I am going to go. He made the decision himself. Could we put up 1 Kings 19, just verse 20, please? Oh, yeah, it's up, yeah, okay. And then it says how he went then. And he, 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 he kissed his father and mother goodbye. Um, he left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And then he said, let me kiss my mother and my father goodbye, and I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So being a spiritual son or a daughter must never be something that is forced upon you. It should be totally up to you whether you follow your Elijah or Elijah or not. Should be totally up to you. But it's good. It's good to find your Elijah and, and, and follow them. And look at their example. Watch totally what they're doing. Um, then Elijah set out to follow Elijah and be his attendant. So they had a, a connection straight away, a relational connection to be his attendant. He wasn't looking for a high position. He was just willing to serve. So, you know, in the body of Christ, we should be all willing to serve, to serve, serve one another, serve the ministry, serve, serve in the house of God. Not to be always looking for, for, for promotion or titles, to serve, because you will be promoted and you'll get titles as you serve. 
as you go on and grow. They will come automatically. Automatically, the Lord will raise you up. Um, when Jesus called the 12 disciples, um, their primary calling was to be with him. And we find that in Mark 3, 14. Can we put up Mark 3, verse 14, please? Then he appointed 12, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. They were with him first, before he sent them out. So they learned from him. They watched everything he did. They watched everything he did, and they done everything he said. So they were his servants at the time. They did the shopping, they took charge of the money, they prepared places for him. I'm sure they looked for accommodation for him, you know, because they would be appointed to do these things, different things. And they, and they loved serving him. They loved serving him. So we should love serving. Uh, so this spiritual father-son relationship doesn't come from being together. Jesus took the twelve nearly everywhere he went. Not only did they minister together, but they all ate together because we read about that, and I'm sure they laughed and talked, and they traveled together, and do you remember it said that John leaned up on them when they were relaxing after their meal? It said, you know, he, he leaned up back on him. This is how you get a spiritual father or mother-son relationship, by, t by taking time out of your schedule and, um, and spending time with the person God has called you to be with and to have that relationship with. By spending time, by spending time. If we come here to every service, we're going to be spending time with our spiritual mother and father here. We'll be spending time with them. We watch what they're doing. We take example from them. We look at their standards. We set our standards like that, high standards. three important things we must do if we are to be spiritual sons. Number one is we must serve. Number two, we must learn from them. And number three, we must stay with the men of God who are who we desire to be our spiritual father or mother. Elisha became Eli Elijah's attendant. Elisha had no hidden agenda in wanting to be with Elijah. He wasn't after a position or a title. He never asked to be his successor. He never asked for anything of his spiritual father until he was asked what he wanted. Uh, instead, Elisha simply served. Elijah, uh, and he, he served his, 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 his master, Elijah, the older prophet, and he tried to make his life and ministry as easy as possible. One of the most important jobs of the spiritual son or daughter is to serve their father or mother. And uh, Timothy was a spiritual son of Paul because Paul always referred to him as his son. Paul would say of him in Philippians, put up Philippians 3, 2, verse 22. Talking about Timothy approved himself. Because Paul was watching him. You could see what he was doing. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. He served. So that's the servant service part. He served. He didn't murmur. He just served. He served. Um, Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Elisha obviously did such a good job of serving Elijah that he was known as the man who used, the, used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And you'll find that in 2 Kings 3.11. We won't go to it because um, we won't have time. Many people want to want the double portion that Eli Elisha received, yet they're not willing to serve an Elijah. 
So you have to be willing to serve to receive these things. You, you don't expect a double portion when you're not serving. You can expect nothing when you're not serving, really, because we, we're called to serve. We're called to serve. If you cannot be faithful where you are, you will never be successful where you're going. So be faithful where you are here, because that will make you successful on your onward journey. That will make you successful, to be faithful. Faithful in coming to your meetings, faithful in serving here. No matter what job you get to do, do it. No grumbling, no murmuring. Just do it. Do it, but just say, well, well, I'm a pastor. I can't be seen picking up soft stuff off the floor or cleaning up in the kitchen. Yes, be seen doing it. It's not for glory, but, but do it. And don't murmur. Do any job you have to do. Any job you have to do. You know, if you have to be here to open up, be here to open up. If you have to wait back to close, if you have to check the heat, whatever it may be, the children to clean up after the sun to school, all that sort of thing. That's serving. That's all. Because when everyone serves, the hands, the, the, it makes life work. I used to tell the joke when the Chinese people <laughs> used to look up at the light and they put the say, many hands make light work when the bowl of it go. <laughs> <laughs> many hands make light work. <laughs> when the bowl of the fumes, they put their hands up. <laughs> It's just to say, that's just a joke. That's not, that's not. <laughs> but you know, it will make life work at the church if everyone does their bit. You know, everyone does their little bit and not to be grumbling. You know, sometimes I can see things that, you know, the children are able to do, but it's not done, you know. Always be looking around, see, what can I do? Not do I have to do that. What can I do? What can I do? You know, everyone can do something. They can tidy up the chairs or if the, or the covers there of the chairs are often skew ways after the meetings. Tidy them up. Margaret won't have to do it the next day if they're, if they're put right and straightened up and all that sort of thing. You know? They do tiny things. The Lord sees everything we do, you know. And you don't go out then and say, look, I've done all the chairs. Aren't I great? No, you don't mention it. You just do it. You keep quiet. Yeah, okay. There it is. There it is in scripture. Scripture. Do everything without murmuring. Okay. We are to learn from our spiritual fathers and mothers. In, in 2 Kings uh, 2, we read of Elijah's last miracle, the parting of the Jordan River. That was before he was taken up in his chariot. To, to, to part. And we also read of Elisha's first miracle. And what was that? The very same miracle. Mm -hmm. He parted the Jordan River. So he was learning from him because he saw him do it and he knew how to do it. He knew the power to work it. So it's just the exact same way as Elijah had done it, he done it. Uh, no doubt as a spiritual son, he had been constantly observing the life and the ministry of Elijah and learning from it. So that we must be constantly observing our spiritual mothers and fathers. To be observing them and learning from them. Observing what they're doing. And, and, and learning from it. We know our pastors are good, so we can learn from them. We know, we know. We call them mummy and daddy, so spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers. Okay, so we learn from them. And that's how the young, young prophet learned. He was watching uh, Elijah. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Paul, confident in his role as a spiritual father, could write to the church in Corinth, and say, I urge you to imitate me. Mm. People would say, oh, that was arrogant of him. Mm. Isn't he full of himself? No, because he knew who he was in Christ Jesus. He knew who he was. He was sure of who he was. It wasn't to look on me with pride, you know, that I'm proud. He said, he said to imitate him, to imitate, because he was doing everything right. So we're to imitate our spiritual mothers and fathers. We're to imitate what they do. Number three, stay with them. As spiritual children, we must never be in a hurry to leave our spiritual mother or father. We must determine not to leave because of boredom or frustration or thinking we don't need them, because that's ego. But to stay till God himself brings the separation. So when it's time for separation, like when it's time for a child to separate and go out and earn his living, there will be a time when you will be going out into your own ministry, hopefully. You won't always 
your name is called to remain and serve here. But you know, the, the, the people are called to other ministries and to go out or to be a branch from here or whatever it is. Um, the role of the father. Why do we need a spiritual mother or a spiritual father? We want them to be a source of impartation to us, that they can impart into us values and the, 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 the life of Christ into us, to impart into us. You know, it, we, we, all, we all like our children to be like us, you know, that we want to impart principles and values into them. We want to impart into them these things. You know, we don't, and if we have made mistakes, we surely don't want them to make the same mistakes. So we'd be, we'd be nurturing them up. So it nurtures them up. So we'd be nurtured up here, not to make mistakes. The, you know, that the, 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 these parents will be a source of impartation to us. Um, and in fact, the Hebrew word, the, the root of that Hebrew, Hebrew word um, uh, is um, its source, source. The source, there'll be a source to us. The, the source to us. Um, Luke 11, verse 13. In Jesus' words, it says, if you, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. So he's, he's saying, even if you're just an ordinary evil father, you know how to give good things to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to, 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 to his children? You know, if an earthly father can do it. Fathers are meant to impart into their children everything that they are able to. Everything that they're able to do, they're meant to impart into their children. And it's the same way with our spiritual fathers. They will want to impart everything that they're able to into us. So when we have a close relationship with a spiritual father or mother, an impartation takes place. Impartation does not only happen from the laying on of hands at the altar calls but as we relationally connect with our spiritual mothers and fathers, you know, we speak with them, we ring them up, we do that, you know, we, we, we have these Bible studies, we have family days, we have all these things where we can speak and get a deeper relationship going, a deeper relationship, that you can tell them anything and they can tell you anything. You can confide in one another, confide, and there's growing in confiding, confiding in one another. You know, they confided in Jesus and they grew and they grew. We read in 2 Kings 3.15, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. These spiritual fathers and mothers who are a source of wisdom, direction, gifting, prayer, anointing, and whatever else they carry are able to impart into us. So there's a lot in mummy and daddy here that they're imparting into us. There's a lot that they're imparting into us. You know, they have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. They have direction in their lives. They have gifting in their lives. They pray continuously, you know, and the anointing is on them. And they carry that and they, and they impart these things onto us. So for every time they lay hands on us, there's an impartation onto us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we, we're not going to be quick to dismiss the wisdom because you think you know better. Some think they know better. And that's why we have so many different congregations and different churches, because people think they know best. They know best. It's in the human wisdom, everybody thinks, but Satan will tell you, you know better anyway. That would be a temptation. You know better. You know better. We are told in Exodus 18, verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. While all advice should be Holy Spirit filtered, we must recognize the need to allow our spiritual fathers and mothers to be a source of wisdom to us. A spiritual father is someone who sees the greatness of God in our lives and calls it out of us and declares over us what they see in us that often we don't ourselves don't see. You often hear Jim will say, you know, stir up that gift within you. She'll encourage you, you know, you used to do this, uh, you know, just get it going again. Believe, 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 believe. You know, I hear it all the time, encourage. Pastor Albert, encouraging you. People that go up there to speak, encouraging people, encouraging people, you know, not to be fearful, you know, to rise up and speak to your spirit and all these things. Encouragement, 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 all the time. So that's what our spiritual fathers and mothers do. Um, Uh, we don't see it often in ourselves. Um, 
They often have a prophetic voice that they speak over us with too. Um, in Genesis, uh, all chapter 49, it talks about Jacob prophesies over, over each of his children. The prophetic words a father spoke over his children were so powerful that once uttered, they could not be revoked. And do you remember the time the two sons came to Jacob and the, the, the boy put on the, the hair, the skins of uh, the goat on his arms so he would be hairy and he, he disguised himself to the father. And uh, the, the, the prophetic words that he spoke over, over him couldn't be revoked. So it should have been the other son. But you see, they were already spoken over. So um, there, there was deception there with the, with the boys. They were jealous of one another, you know? Um, as we grow in our walk with God, we will be t there will be times when our spiritual fathers and mothers have to rebuke us and discipline us. In fact, God our Father often disciplines us through our spiritual fathers and mothers. Our response to this discipline determines whether or not we are true sons and daughters. Proverbs 9 verse 8 says, Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Uh, a rebuke impresses a man or woman of discernment. It impresses them. Proverbs 17, verse 10, and a man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Proverbs 29, verse 1. So don't be stiff-necked. Take the rebukes. Take the corrections. Because it says... A rebuke impresses a man or a woman of discernment. The wise accept and respond to correction. God can restore us, however, if we are defensive and have a who are they to speak to me like that attitude. We are not true children and God cannot do anything with us. If we respond to correction by walking away from that church or we become bitter because we think we are being mistreated. It is a clear sign. It is a clear sign that we have an orphan spirit. And orphans only want to hear encouragement and praise. But true sons and daughters understand that the true role of a father and a mother is not only to encourage and comfort, but also to urge you to live lives worthy of God. In other words, if you're not to correct you, if you're not living the life worthy of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 plus 12. Sorry, can you go back there? Um, yeah. It's, it's an orphan spirit. Uh, no, um, uh, about the, Orphans um, on... The, um, uh, what was it about? Oh, I forgot this Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll pick it up. I read, uh, it, I read it again. I read the last... About, yeah, it's the one about uh, a rebuke impresses a man or woman of discernment. Yeah, discipline, yeah. What's yeah. Discipline, your spiritual father discipline. Yeah, yeah. Our response to this discipline determines whether or not we are true sons and daughters. Oh, yeah. They can dish out discipline too. You know, if you're not living a life worthy of your of God's calling, you know, if they see things in your life that are not of God or are not biblical, they can discipline you, show it to you, and you either take the correction or you don't. It's up to you. You can go away in a huff, or you can sulk, or you can say, well, that's wonderful, because in this scripture, this man said, wonderful. He said, a rebuke impresses a man or a woman of discernment. It impresses them, so they start searching and thinking, yeah, they were right. I'm going to alter that. Yeah. I'm going to do something about that. You make a decision then. But it's up to you to do that. They can discipline all they want, but if you don't want to do anything, then you remain so. You remain so, you know. Is, is that any clearer? Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. But you see, I suppose we Irish are very easy. To, I was a very... Um, touchy person, you know. I uh, People say, I'd say, oh, they think that about me and that, and I'd react. But I've learned not to do that now. You know, I wouldn't take correction easily. Yeah. But I've learned that's stupid. 
really stupid. You take correction when it's due to you, and you should be glad of it. You should be really happy when you're corrected. <laughs> but but, but, but uh, that's not the way it, it, a lot of people take it. You should be very happy when you're corrected, because these people are in for your good. They're trying to lead you on the right path, that you will live a life worthy of God. Um, our willingness to accept our father's no when we say yes, or their yes when we say no, you know, is, is a true test of our sonship, just like what I was saying, you know. Do something about it if they correct you, you know. You can either say yes or no. The same with them, they can say yes or no to you. Like if you're not going to bother it, well then I can leave you. But you know, I can't be your spiritual mother if you're not going to take correction, you know. Yeah. I can't uh, get growth in you, in other words. But that's, she, true, that's true of life as well, like. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. yeah. You know. If you want to get a plant to grow, you know, you give it a little help, tomato feed or whatever it's called, you know, and, and it'll grow, yeah. Again, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no matter how successful we become in ministry, we must always make sure that there are people in our lives who are not afraid to say no to us. They're not afraid to say no to us. In seeing the church as the family of God, we must see our need to become father children by embracing the concept of the spiritual father. Once we have done this, we become not just church members, but sons and daughters of the house. This brings two aspects into play in our lives. First of all, we have responsibilities and we have blessings. Uh, don't treat the church as a place you visit on a Sunday morning. <coughs> Recognize that you are a son and a daughter in the house. Take ownership of things that need doing in the church. Don't say it's the pastor's job. True sons and daughters of the house recognize their responsibilities to meet the needs of the house. They take ownership of a situation where a need arises. Number two, blessings. When we come under a spiritual father or mother, we are positioning ourselves to receive incredible blessings. After years of faithful serving, Elijah, uh, serving Elijah, Elisha found himself in the right place to receive the prophetic mantle. Because he spent years with him. Because he, he, he was an old man, Elijah, when he died. Uh, and he had an incredible uh, ministry of his own afterwards. In 2 Kings 2, verse 13. Well, can we put that up, please? 2 Kings 2, 13, please. This is about the mantle. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the river Jordan. So he took up the mantle. You know, he, 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 he took it unto himself. He took up the mantle. They all observed the mantle, but he was the only one that took it up. He was close enough to receive it, to take it up. The blessing that God gave Abraham was passed down to his sons, Isaac and Jacob. The Bible tells us in Galatians 4, 5, that as God's children, there is an inheritance available to us. Can we put up Galatians 4, verse 5, please? To re redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So, um, God's children, uh, we, we have that inheritance. They, it, it, we are adopted sons of God. We are adopted because of the new birth. When you gave your life to Jesus, you became an adopted son of God. You became an adopted son of God. And you have every right to everything that Jesus has. Because you're an heir with him and you're a joint heir with Jesus. So we have everything. We're adopted sons. Uh, find a man of God who can be your, your, your spiritual father and serve him until he releases you with your own ministry. So you have a mantle on you. You have a mantle of blessings upon you. And they're passed to you as well. All these mantles that they have, they're passed on to you. 
to carry the mantle. You often hear people saying, I have the mantle of, who's big? Captain Coolman and all these people. They say, I have the mantle of this, I have the mantle of Kenneth Hagen, I have the mantle of this, you know, whether in the healing ministry or something like that. They carry the mantle. So this, this can happen. Um, in Matthew 6, uh, thir verse 32, uh, and Matthew 7, 17, will we put up those two um, <coughs> scriptures? Did you get it? Matthew 6, 32. Yeah. Matthew 7, 17. Matthew 6. Is that 22? 32. 32. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, for you, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Uh, we need all the things of of for living. We need all the things for natural living. But we need all the things for spiritual living too. So our Father would supply us all the things for spiritual living. We need them. So he would supply them. And he shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He has everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need is supplied to us to live that life of godliness. There is nothing left short. Nothing left short. He has given us everything. But sometimes we don't receive it. We don't use it. <coughs> it's like if you don't go and cash your check, it's no use to you. You can't use a check. You can't use it unless you get the cash for it. You know, nobody accepts checks that are written to you now. You know, you have to go and cash it and get the value out of it. It's the same thing. We've been given everything for life and godliness, so it's not impossible to live the godly life. It's not impossible because he's given us everything. Everything. Your Heavenly Father knows you need these things. You know how to give good gifts to your children. In understanding this, we soon realize our purpose in life is to invest and impart into those we consider spiritual children. Children, Seeing those we influence as our children, here are some scriptures Paul uses. 1 Timothy 1, 2. And he says, to Timothy, this is the only bit of it I need, so you needn't put it up. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, my true son in the faith. He wasn't his natural son. He was his spiritual son. So he taught him everything. He brought him around with him. He taught him everything. So he learned from him. You know, and we have the Timothy 1 and Timothy 2. We have, he, 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 he's written some of the Bible. T Timothy. Uh, Paul has written to Timothy. Uh, now 2 Timothy 1.18, Timothy my son, he says, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. So he's calling his son there again. And in another place, in 2 Timothy 1 verse 2, he calls it 2 Timothy my dear son. And in 2 Timothy 2 1, he says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then Titus also, in 1 Titus 1 verse 4, he says, so he had two sons, but he, he had two spiritual sons that we know of. He probably had many more. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Uh, they were not his biological children, we know that. Paul had literally adopted these two men as sons of his own in the spirit. So that's two we know about, but there may have been many more because he's done a lot of mission works and he knew a lot of people in all his writings. He mentions this one, this one, this one, sent greetings, greetings, greetings. So he knew a lot of people. So it was probably many of them. Uh, so that, that spirit of adoption had hit Paul. He adopted them as his sons, you know? Just like we are adopted sons of God. It is a natural uh, anointing and grace of the Holy Spirit that he wants to give to us uh, so that we see those whom we influence as our actual children. And they, because um, you hear Jim right there, and she says, Eamon, my son, um, what's the boy that comes on a Friday night? Um, Samir. Samir, my son. Do you ever hear her saying that? She says, Samir, my son. Albert, my son. She says, you know, I notice, I, I, I watch everything you say. <coughs> my son, you know, you always say that, you know. So they're your spiritual sons, you see. And she, she, she speaks it out. 
my son, you know, like we should be saying my sister to you, my, my brother, you know. Do you remember we got the talk about that? With that, so but but you know you you see if you observe what Albert and Jim were saying, like they they say it all. Do you know really and truly we we need to be watching them and watching them and watching them and watching and learning, and they're not puffed up because of that because they know that they're spiritual parents. They know they're spiritual parents to, to the church here. You know. Um. So he, he had these two, two boys, Titus and um, Timothy. Uh, the most important thing we need uh, to be spending our time and energy and resources on is raising up spiritual sons and daughters. You in turn, you won't always be a son and daughter, you'll be spiritual mothers and fathers here. Right. And this is this, you know, because this is what all this study is about, raising you up to be the, those, son, those um, spiritual mothers and fathers to the young ones coming in. If we are going to have revival, we need a lot of spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers here. Like, and that is probably why he's holding back revival for us. Because there's enough spiritual mothers and daughters and, and fathers to, to, to help those young people, young Christians that come in and, and nurture them up. You know, they're still children and they're only learning to crawl and learning to walk. and that. So they'll need spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. So, uh, uh, Train yourselves up fast to become, to come from uh, uh, looking to these spiritual mothers and fathers here, to train yourself up. Listen to everything they say so you will be trained up to become that spiritual father and spiritual mother to the people that come in. Okay. Um, so make sure that the people then are comforted and encouraged and even challenged. Um, and then there will come a time when they'll be released to out into further ministry. As spiritual fathers and mothers, we cannot afford to ignore sin or, uh, or, or uh, immaturity, uh, but must be willing to discipline, rebuke, correct, and constantly challenge our spiritual children to be all they can be in God. So to be... Jim Wayne Albert encourages us to be all that we can be in God. All that we can be. And we can be such a powerful tool in God's hand. We can be such a powerful tool in God's hand. Because everything that Jesus has has been given to us. You know, to set the oppressed free, to, to open blind eyes, to, to set captives free, to do all, to raise the dead, you know, to anoint people, to to encourage people. You know, everything that Jesus had in his ministry has been given to us. We just think we are just human beings. We are more we are human beings with the Spirit of God inside, living inside us. We've been empowered. There's an impartation took place when we when we received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's power was released in us to do God's work. It was released, that power was released in us to do God's work to lay hands on the sick, to do all these things. So don't be afraid to reach out and do those things and give the word of God to everyone we meet in Jesus' name. Um, the whole point of having spiritual children is that ultimately they will be released into their own ministry and destinies. Sometimes we can, uh, we can partner with them in that other times we have to release them and watch them from a distance. Jesus just spent three years with his spiritual children before releasing them into the ministry. There's a lot of us here over three years. Well over three years. I myself am well over three years here. Well over three years. So how, how much have we got in all those years we are here? 10 times three. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you think about it, he raised up so many spiritual children in just three years. He was 30 years when he went ministry, and he died at 33. Only three years in ministry. And there's all those books written. Three years in ministry. Praise God. Have we questions? 
The Holy Spirit will answer all your questions tonight, man. The Holy Spirit will answer all your questions tonight. Yes, every question. It's just an awakening, really. There, there shouldn't be that many questions because it's just an awakening of who we are as a church. This is all these talks that we do on Friday. It's all about awakening us as a church. What is the church? Seeing the church as it is. Seeing the church. We had all this about honor the last month. You know, that we must honor. The honor that we should, that's due to everyone. Regardless, we should honor one another. We should be nice to each other. Love each other. You know, tonight now we should be learning from others. And even an older, an older brother that's gone into secondary school should be an example to the younger brother who's still in primary school. Okay? That's yeah? You see, these are very little ones now. And they're watching everything you are doing. Everything you're doing. So always be aware that you're being watched. You're being watched. Yeah? That little small baby, where is she tonight? She's watching everything that's going on here. So if you're not quiet in church, she's not going to be quiet in church. She's going to start running around and thinking this is a playground. Because you're not sitting down and looking up there and listening to what's being said. She thinks she can do the same thing because she's going to take example from what you are doing. Okay? So we have to lead by example. We have to be very careful. You know, that we come in time to church and all that. Be good example of that. That you have everything organized on Saturday night, your shoes and what you're going to wear, and your breakfast all set out, that you don't have to take your breakfast into in here and eat it and delay, and, and miss the, the, the praise and worship, okay? So you have to prepare yourself, you're old enough now, all of you, to be preparing yourself to be in time on the Sunday to church, okay? No excuses at all. Because what we learn there, that stays with us for life. When you have children, you'll be bringing them in time to church. Okay? Yes. You won't be coming an hour late. Or 20 minutes late. Or 5 minutes late. Or coming for the last half hour. Yeah. So, you know, we discipline ourselves. But everyone is watching everyone else. Not in criticism. But they want, to, they want your example. They want you to be an example to them. They want you to be an example to them. You know, not painting your nails d during the, the, the choir time and that sort of thing. And, you know, repairing a damaged nail and those sort of things. You, you're here, you're in the presence of the Lord, and you give yourself totally, 100% to the Lord when you come here, okay? Not half-heartedly and watching the clock all the time. So will it ever be over? I think I go out to the toilet for another five minutes. It'll be five minutes more gone. You know, and I think if you empty your bladder, there, there might be one occasion where maybe two children should have to go to the toilet. There might be one occasion. But certainly if you empty your bladder before service, you won't need to go out again. Maybe once or twice if, you're, if it's a very cold day or something. But there's a constant parade in here, in and out and in and out and in and out to the toilet. You know, absolutely a constant parade. I think since I came to the church, I went three times to the toilet in all those years while I was at church service. I think about three times. And I'm older than any of you. I'm the grandmother here. Yeah. So you have to train up your bladder to hold more. I'm, I'm only joking now in the, the bladder thing, but, but just, yeah, just, it's just little examples. Just, just to be aware that, that there's somebody younger than you watching you, you know, and lead by example, you know, and if you're a father, lead by example. Correct your child in church if it's not behaving, you know, a mother the same, you know. Don't leave them to other people to correct them in the church. You know, a mother must correct her child in church. You know, a father must correct their child in church if they're not behaving, you know. Don't leave it to the other members of the congregation. It's your responsibility. Yeah, you know. So then there'll be no one blaming anyone else for correcting a child or doing it out of turn, you know. But as a mother in the church, you have authority to call, to call for correction, silence, or whatever it may be, distraction that's down there. It shouldn't be. So you, as the mother or the father in the church, can call for discipline down in the church. Okay? Yeah, add. Not a question. Oh, I'm sorry, No, nothing about the phones. As you were saying about um, 
spiritual parents and all that. Yeah. And even natural parents. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like one thing that I learned, like from my from my parents. Yeah. When my parents had to go to church, like, like we became Christians when I was twelve years old. Yeah. And when my mom and dad didn't start going to church and all that, like. But we have learned, well, I, I, um, I have learned, and, I, and Aim has learned from um, my parents to so get involved in the church, mm. get involved in the ministry, because I've noticed that with my mom and dad, that they, like, any church they ever attended, they always got involved. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like what you were saying. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like when uh, they came to Foundation Ministries, yes. they got involved in the usher. My mom got involved in the cleaning of yeah, the church. The, Yeah, the, yeah, the friendship center. Yeah. yeah, they got involved in it. So, yeah. like, that's what I took from my parents. Yeah. And it might look like when we were younger that we were like the parents. Our parents might have looked that we were watching. Yeah. But we you were, were it, watching. You, were it, yeah. you know, we were watching. Mm -hmm. And that's what like uh, I would say to some parents that uh, even though you might think your children are looking, mm -hmm. they are looking. Mm -hmm. They might not say it, so they will follow your yeah. example. No, I mean, and especially if, if you're a parent in church, yeah. and if you're not getting involved in church, and, you're, and then you're expecting your children to get involved in church, yeah. it'd be very hard for them because they're not yeah. seeing you doing it. Exactly. You know, so like I, I always said, that's what, what I learned. That's why, like, like e even like um, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it. Even like where one of my brothers, he says to me before that. The problem with this with, with this Catholic family is they keep getting involved in ministry, yeah. and that shouldn't be, you know what I mean? So he says, Ali, one thing I said to you that um, he says, I can He says, don't get involved in it. Go to the church. Go on Sunday. Go on Friday. But leave the after church. Don't get involved. And like I I I let him say what he wanted to say. He didn't reply back to him or nothing. Yeah. But I knew that that is not me. I mean, I, I was like, in my head, I was like, that might be him, that might be what he wants to do, yeah. but that's not me, because it's in me to, it's, it, 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 it's, it's in my blood, yeah. so to speak, it's in my blood Jesus to be, yeah, yeah, to be involved, you know, yeah. so that's why it's, it's, it, it, it's natural, like, when I do come, um, come to, like, any ministry I went to, like, um, <coughs> it's, it's a natural thing for me to, like, I just, like, oh, well, I said, yeah. it's, it's yeah. in the blood, yeah. And if it's in your blood, you're going to do it, and it's going to come easy. And then, like what you were saying about your rebukes, yeah. you are going to get rebuked, mm. you know, and getting up and walking out after you get rebuked. Because I, I used to do it in my like, um, early walk with God, is when I got rebuked, I get up, I storm out, you know what I mean? But the thing is now, it's kind of like, it, like um, yes, it is hard to get rebuked, mm. but it's like what you said, you stay, yeah. you don't let it move you. Yeah. But even though you might get hurt from it, you just stay I, I, and you don't let it move you. Amen. Amen. Very good. Very good. Yeah, and you know what you're trained up, uh, Jemima, uh, Jemima, yeah. Jemima, her daughter, was in Dublin, and we were up at a conference or something, and my daughter came to it, and she had a couple of small children with her, but she was going home on the bus. Jemima just said, come, I'll take you home. That impressed me. Yeah. She didn't have to be asked. She saw a need. She filled the need. And it was wonderful. Because she's trained up, she's been watching. That's exactly what her mum and dad would have done. Exactly what they would do. You know, and I was forever grateful. It was absolutely wonderful. You know, she got home and it's her at the time. You can imagine waiting on a bus with children and things. But, it, you know, it, you, you see it, you see it in the families that are, that are godly and training up their children well. The children will do it. It's, it's, it's automatic in them, they will do it. They know it's the right thing to do. They know it's the right thing to do. Praise God. I say praise God. Hallelujah. You see, it's very, very, very important that, you know, the role of moms and dads in the impartation to the next generation is very important. There's a woman, you know, 
very recently I started listening to, you know, uh, Vesta Mangan. Okay. Mm. This woman, each time it was the son's birthday, she would pray from morning till night. Why wouldn't that child's life move to the right direction? I am challenged as a spiritual mom that my duty is to pray for everyone here, especially during their birthday, from morning to night. That is a responsibility. You know, it came to a time that Moses told the children of Israel, God forbid of somewhere, that God forbid that I should not pray. It's a sin. It's a sin. You see, if you begin to see your duty as a mom, a mother in the Lord, you know, as a responsibility from God, or whatever you're doing in the body of Christ, as a responsibility unto God, then you will do it with fear. You won't do it with anything. If I don't pray for the church, it's a sin. So if you don't pray for me too, it's a sin. You know, when you see it that way, it will increase the relationship. It will increase, you know, the outcome of what happens in the house of God. Every child has a duty. And every parent has a duty as well. You know, you say, if you rebuke a wise man, yeah. he will love you. But when you rebuke a fool, a fool hates you. Yeah. So which means rebuke are not for fools. Mm. Rebuke are for the wise people. Mm. Okay? Because there is no way if you're training a child, you will not rebuke a child. Mm. You see, don't spoil the child and spare the rod. Mm. It's always important to, it goes hand in hand. What am I asking for? I'm asking for us to rise up. Rise up as as children, rise up as parents. Rise up and do what God expects us to do. Rise up in our responsibility. Let us serve this God. He, she talked about three responsibilities. Serve, learn, and then stay in there. Jesus said to us, we are not of them that draw back. We are of them that continue to the saving of souls. We don't draw back. We don't, somebody comes in here, an alcoholic, we don't give up on the person until the person is saved. They can come in here smelling alcohol, we don't give up on them. We keep praying until we see God save them. <laughs> we see people come in here with different kinds of, you know, situations, we don't give up. We still love them and pray for them until there is a turnaround. Children should be seen growing up, not diminishing. Just between Elijah and Elisha. You saw exactly what Elisha saw Elijah doing. That's what he did. But if you didn't see him do that, if maybe when Elijah is doing something, he's busy, you know, on his phone, he wouldn't have learned. The same thing I cry for our children. I, say, I need to see, my desire is to see a child pray. I'm yet to see. I have not, it's not that we have not demonstrated and modeled prayer in every area. But what happened? Why haven't it caught any one of them? Why haven't anyone picked up the, you know, the button, the button to say, I am going to pray. You don't rely on your mom to pray all the time. You also pray yourself. So that when you come to the same obstacle your mom came to and won, you can also come to that obstacle and win. When Elijah was, Elijah was coming back, Elijah was not there. And he faced the same obstacle. If he didn't learn, he couldn't have crossed that Jordan. And whether we like it or not, we all face Jordan. Jordan can come in many ways. But if you don't learn, you learn how did they overcome? How did they overcome? The way they overcome, I will overcome that way. Let the children rise and pray. You don't need anybody to tell you to pray. 
My house shall be a house of prayer, not a day of thieves or robbers. Just the way you don't need anybody to tell you, play your PlayStation, go on Instagram and MoneyGram and all the grandgrams. You don't need anybody telling you to do that. The same thing, you don't need anybody to say, study your word. Study the word of God. Fill your heart with the word of God. The days are dangerous. Because the days are dangerous. It's only with the word of God and prayer that you are able to overcome. This day. That's why I'm crying. I'm speaking everywhere. Read. Study the word. Get it into your spirit, man. Pray. And when you do that, you become overcomer. Because this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. And how can you have faith? Only through the word of God. Faith coming by hearing and hearing the word of God. You will not always have your apostles or your pastors or your fathers or your mothers going. You might you will be where you will be able to stand. Stand. So mothers increase, children increase. And it makes the church easy. It makes the work of God easy. When we come in here, everybody is praying. I mean, one shall chase a thousand, yes, two shall put ten. Accord, I'm telling you. Things happen when you're in one yes. accord. Everyone praying with the same mind and uh, elevated to God. Their minds and their hearts elevated mm -hmm. to God. And there's the same mind. There's unity then. There's unity among us then. And things happen. They were in one accord when the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. came down. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit can come down afresh again That's on right. all of Ennis as we are mm -hmm. praying. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All of Ennis mm -hmm. mm -hmm. can happen the same mm -hmm. way. So mm -hmm. We must be of one accord. Mm -hmm. You can't just have all different things. No, 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 no. All no. of one accord. No, no. All, all to be of one accord. Daddy, and please, could you put up um, Ezekiel 20, verse 30 mm -hmm. for us? We're going to pray. Who moved the thing in their house? Who remembered to move something in their bedroom or their house? Nobody. Albert, Albert did. did. Albert did. Good, 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 good. You did. The, the idea was that. Is it something you'll be doing in the morning, very early in the morning, whatever it will be, if a garment or anything, or tea bags or whatever, or milk or whatever, to move it to a different place than it's always located in the house. Move it to a completely different place that you'll have to go and get it. And you will say, oh, well, you know, this is different. And you'll say, have I put God number one today? Have I good, said good morning to God? Have I greeted him? Am I thankful that I woke up? He'll put the breath in my And, you know, that's just... Um, yeah. Yeah. If you haven't done it, do it. And then after after three weeks, move it again. What well, one Pastor Mary is trying to pass across, you know, what the inspiration came from the Holy Spirit is. That the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing will be added. But we notice that in real life, people seek other things and put the kingdom of God last. So we made up our mind that we want to put a kind of remembrance, something to take on our mind to say, is God first today? Is God first today? Maybe what you normally used to do is to brush your teeth when you wake up in the morning. Now, instead of brushing your teeth when you wake up in the morning, you first of all go to talk to God and say, good morning. Thank you for today. You appreciate him and you acknowledge him. Putting him first before you start doing any other thing. So you can put a reminder that will remind you if it is, you know, or your flower, if it is your alarm, whatever it is that makes you. If your alarm is at 7.30, you can put it at 7.20 so that that 10 minutes, you use it to, you know, put God first. Put God first. And when you put God first, he puts you first as well. If you put him first in your list, he will put you first in his list. If you put him last, he will put you last. That's how it works. And I believe God wants to do something tremendous. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, can we stand as we pray? Please. Oh, Daddy, did you want to say something? Okay. Please, I want you to take one person. Pair up, because we are going to pray. Pair up. And I don't want to play pair up. You have to pair up with somebody you will be able to pray with. It's not the time to, 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 to play. Pair up with an adult because things are about to happen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are we all paired up? Okay. So he said, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall 
and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I will not have to destroy it, but I found none. But God has found you, and God has found me. So what we're going to, I like, I like another translation, yeah, King James translation, that is uh, English, I like an edge, who will make an edge, who will build a wall. So you're going to build a wall up around the person you're holding, and you're going to, you see, it's when the wall is broken, that's when serpents can come in and bite you. But if any area, by any means, something has opened up in your life that is causing troubles to come in, we are asking God to block that. Let the world be rebuilt so that the serpent cannot enter again. And after that, you pray the second prayer. The second prayer is, destruction must not touch you. That I should not destroy it. When you stand in the gap, you are standing in the gap, you say, God, for this man, for this woman, let destruction not come near. Let that person not experience destruction. Let us pray. Oh, Rasha Teyabalala. Imbala Koro Sieteriatata. Lembo Kuria Dayaka. Father, we come to you. Oh God, in knowledge of God, we come believing your word to God. Lord, you say you're looking for a man to stand in the gap. We are. You have found us, God. We are in your presence today. We are in your presence today. Lord Almighty, we stand on behalf of God Almighty of our generation. We stand on behalf of our families, our brothers and sisters, our sons and our daughters. We stand to God on behalf of our husbands and our wives. We stand before on behalf of God, of the body of Christ. And Lord, we pray, oh Lord, every wall that been broken, Lord, build the wall again for us. You say you build your church and the gate of hell will not prevail, oh God. Every wall of Lord Almighty that has been broken, let it be built, oh God. Build us again, oh God. Build us again, oh God. Build us again. Let that be no opening, oh God. Let the Satan can touch us in the name of Jesus Christ. Let that be a sinner with the blood of Jesus. Man, God, oh God, yes, Jesus Christ, now are we free? 